Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Nancy asked uh, if I would like to stand up and welcome everybody to uh, Heron Point, or as I like to call it, the house that Burton built. <laughs> so welcome everybody to the celebration of life for Mike, or also as some of us like to call him, B-Tone. Please take the time today to look back and reflect on all the great memories uh, you might have shared with Mike. Please know that Nancy and the entire Burton family are very thankful to everyone that has reached out and also attended today's celebration of life for a man we will love, we have loved so dearly. At this time, I would like to invite Gord Green up to the front, who will be officiating today's celebration of life. Th thank you, Scott. And as I understand it, he called you one of the few people to be able to call you Scotty. Um, I'm glad that we are all so respectful that Mike, who didn't want any fuss, who didn't want any celebration, who doesn't want much happening, that you all attended to create a fuss, say some nice things, hear some nice things, and to celebrate it. So today, really, the, the tone that uh, we want today is one of celebration. We're about to celebrating uh, the life of a man who is known to all of us with different facets of life. I just want to say that, uh, unfortunately, Pastor John Strand was going to do the officiating today, but you'll have to put up with me. I'm Gord Green, a, a friend of the family for almost 33 years. But I want to read this just to put us in remembrance. That Michael Douglas Burton, or as we know Mike, passed away peacefully, surrounded by his family on May 5th at Emmanuel House Hospice. For over 41 years, he's been married to Nancy, who stood up on cue. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of you don't need to stand up and come forward, but uh, uh, he's the father of a much cherished Michelle and uh, Matthew, uh, and their partners Ryan and Alexis. He also leaves behind his mother Anne. Uh, condolences, Anne. Uh, and sister Lydia and her husband, uh, or, uh, his brother-in-law, her husband Michael, or Linda. It's the why. It's the why. Mike has also been missed by many other brothers and sisters-in-law, his nieces, nephews, and extended family. But Mike was a highly respected, as you all know, by the place that we have here. He was a highly respected member of the golf community for over three decades. That's 30 years of youth don't know a decade. <laughs> and I feel a little irreverent standing up here today to officiate at the celebration not wearing a golf shirt. I don't think I ever saw Mike not in a golf shirt. But uh, today we're going to hear stories uh, and memories from a few of Mike's family and friends, as well as enjoy a few songs from Laura Porter and Barbara Simmons, both uh, longtime friends uh, and their kids have been friends with Nancy and Mike's kids for many uh, decades uh, after you. Okay, Nancy asked me to sing one of Mark, Mike's favorite songs. There it is. The Kleenex is on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh 
houses of people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. What a wonderful
I'd like to invite uh, Matthew and Alexis to come forward, followed by Michelle and Ryan, and then Nancy to come and share their hearts. Thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, thank you, Heron Point, for having this beautiful event. My dad and I spent lots of time here growing up. Every view of this course makes me feel like he's right there with me. My dad got me into golfing here at a fairly young age. A poor attempt to help my golf game. I'd be here a lot as a kid, getting a couple of holes in at the end of the day together, stopping for food afterwards, always putting it on his tab. That was a big mistake. <laughs> I would be here a lot as a kid. Um, my dad was a family man. He loved to enjoy a nice meal at the end of a long day here. He loved to sit in the backyard with my mom, enjoying a glass of wine and a Caesar salad. He loved loading the family up into his truck to go out to uh, ride my sister's horse. He would uh, turn a small chore, like plowing snow or trimming hedges into a family event, taking turns on his lap steering or on his shoulders trimming. He loved to take us to some new fishing spots or out on the old boat he liked to call the submarine. <laughs> he loved to take me golfing at one of his many superintendent buddies courses, taking her time. He would show me all the changes since the last time he was there and explain the individual features of all the courses. Uh, we would spend more time thinking about the landscapes than our golf games. <laughs> My dad loved to be with family. He could really appreciate the beauty in things. He was one to take his time driving and appreciate all the views, snapping pictures of anything he thought was beautiful and send it to whoever he thought would appreciate it most. My, love, my dad loved to be at the family cottage, watching the sunset over Lake Huron. There was nowhere else he would rather be. Whenever I play golf, catch a fish, hear a good joke, or see a beautiful landscape. I feel my dad right there with me, and I'm fortunate that the man he was has made the man I am today. Thank you. together. Uh, my fondest memory of the golf course here was when I was really young and my dad would take my brother and I to work early before the sunrise. It was still dark. Uh, we would sleep in the back seat of his truck and when we would wake up we knew to go into the shop and find him in his office and he would take us into a golf cart and we would ride over the rolling hills to the clubhouse where we would get to go into the kitchen and pick a cookie right out of the oven, which one we'd have while it was baking. I am so proud to be my dad's favorite daughter. <laughs> <laughs> he taught me so much. He taught me perseverance. To do and be your absolute best in everything you can. When I went to apply for my first job, he made me return to that Tim Hortons, not once, not twice with my resume, but three times before the manager had to give me an interview. Uh, when he came with me to buy my first car at the Ford dealership, he asked them for an SUV at the price of a sedan. When I brought home averages of 80s and 90s from school, he would always ask, what happened to the last 5%? <laughs> my dad always wanted me to do and be my absolute best. 
but my dad was also sensible. He knew and preached that if there's nothing you can do about it, it's not worth worrying about. He taught me to do everything you can, well you can, until it's beyond your control, and then just be content and proud of what you accomplished. He showed me how to do this through his very own joie de vivre, his love of life and good things. It didn't need to be complicated. Actually, life is even more enjoyable when it's simple. A glass of wine and a Caesar salad with my mom at 3 p.m. every day in the backyard beside the pond or in the house beside the wood fire in the winter. A beautiful cottage, a day out at the barn, good, real friends, a big-ass steak. <laughs> Life was simple and enjoyable. My dad had a true and pure appreciation for nature. I learned that from him. The different trees, sounds, animals. I thank my dad for teaching me these things. I also thank my dad for teaching me how to love and how to be patient. <laughs> of humor. My dad and I would tease each other all the time. When I was at the football game on Thursday night, I was waiting for the Argos rule tie cat suck text, <laughs> but I never got it. I'm gonna miss my dad so much, but I am so thankful that he was my dad. I love him. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Oh, look at them all over there. <laughs> Turn over this way a little bit. So, I'm gonna talk about Mike, my favorite man. What a sweetheart to live with. So, there's, I've been taught that there's five love languages. There's time and gifts. Those were my husband's biggest love languages. There's also touch, word of affirmation. That's five of them, yeah. So we're going to talk about um, time and gifts. And then I'm going to tell you where Mike is and how we got there. So, and then I'm going to tell you about how we met. So Mike and I met in high school, summer school. So I went from French to English, and my dad got this bright idea that I should do my five years high school in four if I went to summer school. So, and you know what, back then you didn't say no to your dad, you just did it, right? So, and not only in, back then they had one in July and one in August too, so anyways. So lo and behold, um, Mike went to the same summer school and uh, that year we were taking gym. Now, I was going to upgrade myself because dad thought I should do this quick and Mike, well he had a body cast on for part of that year. He played football a little bit too hard. And, um, and he liked to miss classes at school, and he also liked to be a little bit smart aleck a bit, so the, the gym teacher said, you're going to summer school. Well, it was a good thing. <laughs> um, so the first day at summer school, um, they told me that the, in the first day, you're not gonna do anything. You're just, it's just an overview, you know, so I had just made the day before this little, well, it wasn't little, it was a pretty little celery green dress. It had a little v-neck, puffy sleeves, and a tie at the back, and it was so cute. And I thought, we're not doing nothing, I'm wearing my dress. So, but I brought running shoes, I wasn't stupid. So I get there that day, and we did the overview, and they told us what we're going to do, like we did track and field, we did swimming, we did all these things, and, um, and now we had extra time and we were going to play baseball. Now, I've never seen T... TV with sports on it in my house ever, like my dad didn't do sports. So um, I didn't know much about baseball. So, but I put my running shoes on and the girls were allowed to go out uh, and hit as many times as they needed to to get the ball out. So finally got that ball out and Mike was on first base. I don't know who Mike was, 
But anyways, but I didn't, I like to do the rules. And the rules, to me, thought, you can't go past that line, right? So when I get up to there, well, I just kind of go like this because I'm not allowed to pass the line and I'm running so fast. And that's how I met Mike. <laughs> so lo and behold, I don't know why, he thought I was a bit of a snob. So I don't know. Anyways, I noticed him and his girl, other girl was following him around, which was fine. And um, <laughs> Um, I did archery in, in school and so did Mike. So when they found out that we both could eat, at least hit the target, they put us on together and he started talking to me. And um, that went well. And then I got um, poison ivy in my, we had an apple orchard and I got poison ivy. And we used to do track and field and my feet would just burn. So I would whip off my running shoes and scratch my feet. And so he came over and asked me what was wrong, and I told him, and he took me to the pharmacy to get cream, so that was, <laughs> that was our first date. <laughs> so then he finally asked me out, and we went to Niagara Falls. I spent every cent he owned. So, um, so just so you know, guys, Mike, you know, that's his other gift is uh, the gift of giving. And um, he did, you know, if, if you know, if I didn't watch it, he, through the years, he would have spent money we didn't own. <laughs> I'm the opposite, I'm thrifty, so, um, you know, he'd give me anything, but I always wanted to make sure I, I could afford it. So, anyways, um, now the other amazing thing that Mike was so happy about was that my parents owned an apple orchard. And what do they have on an apple orchard? A tractor. Oh my goodness. Mike helped build this place and um, you know he loved being on the tractor so he would come out and park that tractor I didn't even know what type it was Dennis what was it? International. International. In, in international I think it was um, it wasn't gas it was diesel diesel yeah see I knew that much <laughs> and, uh, so Mike it was red and um, Mike loved that tractor like he would you know he, we would go get the, all the apples that were picked and and in the winter we would we would be on the tractor, and of course, because of that gift of time, he always wanted to do it with me. I, you know, I had to sit on the wheel well while he was doing this, and I did say to him at one point, like, so, so tell me, do you like me more than the tractor? <laughs> I, think, I think he did, I think he did. I'm talking about our love languages of time because I got the privilege to almost spend I'm standing on my tippy toes here. Almost spent 41 years of being married to him. We were shy of one week. We did everything together. Um, we didn't go on outside dates a lot because Mike knew how to cook steak, as you all know, and he also knew how to cook chicken. And even though he didn't eat fish, he knew how to cook fish. And then I would give him the asparagus and I'd wrap it up and, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm just giving you everything because he was so good at it. So we stayed home a lot now. And uh, he would barbecue probably four out of seven days a week, even during the winter. And that's why the barbecue used to be right beside the side sliding door. So he could, from, mon from Thursday to Sunday, he could watch golf at the same time as barbecue. <laughs> very important to him. Mike liked to be um, alone, so um, the only time I was not allowed to, not allowed, you know, he just, well, he wouldn't answer, is when he was at work. He, you know, thought that work was very important and that, you know, my little questions could wait. I mean, he could say it that way, but uh, that's kind of what he thought. And I remember one day I came up with a great idea that, you know, he's the boss, right? I mean, he's the boss. So I said, Mike, do you think maybe I can make him? picnic lunch and we could, you know, there's lots of places we could just sit in and pick lunches. I don't have time to have picnic lunches at work. Like, you know, so there was no go. I tried to squeeze in there in the middle of the day and it didn't work. Now, once he was home, he was definitely available and, um, you know, had all my time. But uh, when he was at work, he, he was at work. I'm going to skip out here. Um, to um, five years after being married. We got married, obviously. We don't have a lot of pictures of that just because we didn't have Alexis around at the time. <laughs> so, um, uh, now, Mike said, that Michelle said to him while he was still alive, she says, Dad, what do you want for a funeral? 
And he said, I want to be cremated. And he says, everything else gets left up to me. So, um, so Dad, you might be new to this. I want to talk about also um, God in our lives because you know God is very important to me. And Mike made me laugh a lot about what he thought about God. Um, <laughs> but anyways, in the end, he figured it out that the big guy really is real. So um, I want to read you a couple promises that have to do with that mean a lot to me and that are are key in our life. And the one of them was. Um, that I will be with you in trouble, and I think of that, and it will deliver you and honor you. I think of Mike when um, the pond drained, remember that? And there was no water, and there was like 19 trucks a day that would come to, um, to the course to add like that much water in the pond, but just enough for Mike to be able to water the greens and the teas, and everything else was dormant. And he did say to me, well, where's God, like, you know? And I said to him, he's in the 19 trucks. <laughs> he said he would be with us in trouble, right? So, I mean, you know. And then there is, be still and know that I am God. It says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And, um, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you exactly what that means yet, but uh, I'll explain it as we go. And then there's Psalm 40. It says, Many, O Lord, O God, are the wonders you have done. The things you've planned for us, no one can recount to you. When I try to speak of them and tell them to you, there's too many to declare. So I just think we were so blessed all of our life. So um, Mike would call it luck, and I would call it the favor of God. So um, five years into our marriage, um, first thing that happened is, um, we said we'd wait five years for kids, and we did, and then I had two miscarriages. So now the, the good thing about that is that Mike's up there right now, and he's got two kids. So I get to keep two, and he gets to have two. So there's always a good way to look at everything in life. At the time, it was hard, but um, it, it's a good thing. Um, so Mike started off as a salesman, and he decided he wanted not to do that anymore. He was tired of smiling all the time, and uh, <laughs> talking to people. That's just not Mike. So um, he didn't know what he wanted to do, but he thought, he, it was 1983, and he thought he could get a job easily. So he quit his job, and he started going to some of the suppliers, and nobody was hiring. So, um, and I started panicking. So I thought, oh my goodness, I wanted to sell the house, I wanted to sell the car. You know, I didn't want to be in debt. So, he sold the car, but then to look back, now he later on in life he got a truck, and he much prefers his truck than the little car he had. And um, so he decided he wanted to be a golf course superintendent. So he quit his job, made a fair bit of money, and started working minimum wage at Hamilton Golf and Country Club. Now he told them that I want to do this for a living, and darn, he was good at all stuff like. You know, my hedge is like, you could put a, one of those leader things on it and it's right on and then I would go, hold this, and I would, <laughs> okay, if I stand like this and I go like this, it should be all the same, right? Well, it's not. So, <laughs> that's the only time that Mike ever let me hold, um, try to cut hedges, so he would just do it by hand. Um, what happened then is um, he, Heron Point, not Heron Point, Hamilton, um, realized that he was good at what he did, and they put him through school, another blessing, um, and they paid him a salary while he was going to school. Um, you know, it's just amazing how I just could see God's hand in, in everything we touched, you know. And then uh, later on, he started at uh, Heron Point. He got hired to um, he want, he just like Michelle said, um, he knocked on Heron Point's doors for probably close to six months. He would, every couple of weeks he would go see the guy that, um, I don't know which guy he went to see, but um, he, he offered to um, build it. So he helped like shape all the, the valleys and the hills. And, and then he asked if he could um, see the grass and they said yes. So then he seeded all the grass. And another blessing is that it rained all that summer. And uh, I forget if it was in one of the golf 
magazines or in the Hamilton spec, but they said that at the end of the season, it looked like the golf course was five years old. And uh, I would tell them that uh, that was the Lord's blessing. And I wasn't sure about it, but I just kept telling them. <laughs> and then things would happen like, I would buy a phone and he'd buy a phone, an identical phone. His always got things wrong with it. And I would always be his little person, and I didn't mind doing this. I don't mind talking to people, so I would go get the phone fixed, and, and then it'd ring again, and something else was wrong. And he says, how come yours never breaks? And serious, all the phones in the last 10 years or whatever, mine never breaks, and Mike's always does. So. <laughs> I don't know. And his Fitbits. He loved his Fitbits, and he's gone through three, and I've gone through one. And he always wonder, like, you know, and I said, I don't know, Mike. I don't know. I don't know who you're asking for help for. But... <laughs> Maybe not the same person as me. So, and then I wanted to tell you a little dream I had that the Lord um, blessed us with, and it was my our wedding. So we wanted to get married on the apple. I mean, I moved there when I was 10 years old, I moved out when I was 18, and walking through the apple orchard and the trees, and the, and the birds singing in the trees, and the little canaries, it was so amazing, and I want to get married there. So my dad decides, six months before we're going to get married, that he's going to sell the farm. So I thought, okay, so we ended up having getting married on a Friday night, because we couldn't even get a Saturday. And that was all good, we had a wonderful wedding, and, uh, but I wanted to go fast forward about Five or six years after our marriage, I met TJ. Where are you, TJ? Anyway, stand up. Oh, stand up for just a second. So TJ is like a daughter to me. I, I got to know her before I had children. And I remember the first time TJ came over. Um, you know, we started hanging out a bit, and I said grace out loud. And um, Mike walked out of the room. So I said, now hold on here, you. I said, um, I say it in my head all the time. I said, when TJ's here, I'm going to say it out loud. And he, he went with that. He went with that. But what the amazing thing is, is when TJ got married, she didn't know that um, my desire had been to get married in a golf course. I'm not in a golf course. In um, Apple Orchard. And, um, you know, and that dream was gone, and that was okay. But, you know, lo and behold, and I didn't tell TJ that I wanted to become... Um, a counselor and my dad told me they didn't make enough money so he didn't want me to apply for it and of course I didn't so um, so what does TJ do she goes and gets married in an apple orchard because her boss was working for a landscaper and he just happened to own an apple orchard and like she didn't know I didn't tell her and uh, so we had this wonderful wedding in the apple orchard that was and then of course TJ you know says I want to become well she's a child youth worker she's a counselor so so God is so faithful that if he sees little girls have dreams, he still makes them happen, but sometimes in a different way. So TJ and I have been uh, friends for years. I'm like Nana to their kids, and, and they're wonderful. And, and on top of that, to put the icing on the cake, where does she move? A street called Golden Orchard. Like, you know, like. <laughs> so, I mean, it just was so him. And Mike was thankful, too. I mean, he realized it. Um, that, you know, that maybe there was a big guy up there. Um, little things that would happen, like I would, um, I would say I need a new purse, and then I'd go to my mother-in-law's, and she just happened to pull out this new purse, and she said, I don't need this anymore. And I'd go home, and I'd say, Mike, look it. I remember I wanted a new purse, and, was, and, Mike, and Mike would say, that's amazing. And then he'd start saying, oh, it's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> he would love saying that. I would want some flowers, and I wanted these flowers of one type or another, and I would come back and say, oh, Mike, guess what? They were on sale half price, and he said, oh, it's a miracle! <laughs> Just, so he was starting to figure out that maybe the big guy, you know, that maybe he did, you know, like me, and, and you know, him too. He did ask me over the years to have it rain, and, um, he, um, and then when I decided that we should sell the cottage because we could never go, because he was always working, um, and uh, it didn't sell, he told me that maybe the big guy didn't really want to sell it. So, so we didn't try to sell it. I said, okay, I'll just keep it. I want to tell you about one of my, Mike's other virtues, that he's a patient man, but no one is born patient. But if you live with me, you become patient. <laughs> my poor sweetheart. 
he always wanted to spend time with me, but he didn't want to do dishes. So he bought me a dishwasher the year Michelle was born. And, uh, and I let him get away with that because he would fix everything in the house. You know, we would, everything I wanted to be fixed uh, would, would be done. He would, um, I would, he would always say, aren't you finished those dishes yet? And I'd say, yeah, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming. And I'd stop my dishes. And that's why if anybody knows me coming in my house, it's a disaster in my kitchen. It's because I sat with Mike instead of washing dishes. Um, and the deal was when we went to the cottage is that um, he would we'd leave Friday around lunch hour and, and he'd always say to me, so Nancy, what time are we leaving? And he'd say, I'd say, we'll leave at 11 o'clock. So he'd come in at 10.30 and like I wasn't near being ready and I never was, I never was. Um, one day I went away with one of my girlfriends and he came home and I was ready and he was so ticked. And I, I, said, <laughs> I said, she doesn't know me yet. <laughs> On time. Um, he never laughed at me when I lost my phone. Now, I'm always a person that before I finish this task, I'm already thinking of the last one. And I leave my phone almost every day at my mother-in-law's because uh, I visit her every day. And, um, and, and, but he never, he would always I say, oh, Mike, I lost my phone. Oh, Mike, I lost my keys. And he would just find them. He, he, he never said, you dummy person or nothing. Like, he just would always find them because he, he loved me. and. Michelle asked him before he died, because Mike doesn't speak a lot often, uh, especially when he's sick, um, she made a list of things to write down uh, of, of what, like one of them was what made him laugh, and no word of a lie, of course, he said, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think, let me see here where I'm going to go. Just going to talk about Mike a little bit when he got sick. Um, so that was an easy time, but he, we were instead of going to, um, you know, going out to drink wine or have a salad, we would go to the hospital or we would go to the doctors, and uh, he was. We were always together. It was a great thing, um, and you know, I was concerned about him not knowing God yet because you know. That's up to everybody, and uh, to me it's wise, but anyways, he, um, he finally did make that decision. Um, I said to him, I said, you know, Marcy tells me, because he went out to the golf course and Marcy was there, Mark was there, and they said, Marcy tells me that you're concerned about me. And I said, I said, the only thing you have to be concerned about is I want to be with you forever. And like, you know, there is two places. <laughs> you don't want to go down, you want to go up. And uh, so anyways, he finally figured it out. And he, I, so I asked him, I asked him, I said, Mike, you, you need to go to God, you need to go to Jesus. And now he said, okay. I mean, like, you know, I didn't do a happy dance or nothing. I just let it be. But um, anyway, so I know where he is. So when, um, when I think of my husband, I know now where he is. Um, so, you know, the Lord reminded me when Mike was sick, he said, every day is a gift. So Mike and I enjoyed ourselves anyway. Um, he also told me that it was an honor to serve my husband, to give him those glasses of water at the, in the last days and all that kind of stuff. It was, it was, it was an honor. So if I don't cry too much, it's because I know where he is. I can't text him anymore. I still have his number though, but I can pretend. <laughs> But I can't tell him how beautiful the rhododendrons are and all that kind of stuff. But um, I, I know I'll see him again and I'll meet my two other kids. Thank you for listening. time I want to invite a couple of long-term colleagues of Mike to come share. First, uh, Andrew Keffer is going to come forward. Uh, Mike uh, and Andrew have known each other for uh, at least 35 years uh, and uh, they've both been esteemed golf links colleagues to each other. Um, Doug, who will come after Andrew, uh, has known Mike for about 20 years. Likewise, worked with Mike, been a good friend and colleague at Club Link. So uh, if, um, Andrew, you can come forward. Yeah. 
Did you say 35 years? Is it 35 years? More? Well, that must look pretty good. <laughs> 25. 25. Can everyone hear me okay? <clears throat> For those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, um, I did, uh, I was a colleague of Mike's for 25 years, and probably first and foremost uh, over those years became a really good friend. I'll just rehash a little bit, Nancy touched on Mike's uh, history in the golf industry. He, um, Mike was the, before coming to Heron Point, was the assistant superintendent at Hamilton Golf Club, which we all know about as it hosts the Open today. Um, and so it was an opportunity for Mike back then, again, I didn't know him at this time, but it was a great opportunity for him to uh, grow in the business and, and get his first superintendent's role. So in 1991, he transitioned from a construction superintendent to the operational uh, golf course superintendent for Heron Point's first year. And under Mike's, under Mike's tenure, Heron Point hosted many prestigious events. In particular, it held the Canadian Masters event, which I think had maybe for a decade, many, many years. Most notably, Mike Weir won it in 1997. Um, as well, Heron Point also hosted um, an annual New Grow event, which I think that was another decade of events, which um, saw many turf industry uh, professionals from all over southern Ontario participate in. Um, this event I actually played in it many times with a few of the guys that are here today. And it was something that we always looked forward to being invited to. Was, the conditions were always exceptional. So it was uh, really hats off to Mike for that. Um, Mike quickly proved, so Clublink bought uh, Heron Point in 1994. And very quickly, we were a small group, there was four clubs that year. And then we quickly grew into the late 90s to, um, at that point, 50 or 20 clubs. And we had a wide range of superintendents, young and old, and uh, inexperienced and experienced. And everyone seemed to gravitate to Mike. Anytime anyone needed advice, Mike was the number one contact. I can say so myself. My first year as a superintendent, uh, calling him a number of times, and, and he was always a great help. And uh, always a few laughs, always made you feel comfortable as well. So super, really appreciated. Um, one of the greatest accomplishments of a golf course superintendent is to see your staff succeed and grow uh, in the golf business. And Mike played a big part in the success of many young managers who worked for him. Steve Mize, who's here today, his younger brother Tim, Andy Bishop, who became a police officer, was, was uh, Mike's assistant. Mike Giblin, who's a superintendent uh, locally. Mark Poxai, who's still a current mechanic here. They've all started their careers with Mike and have all flourished uh, on their own. So it's nice, nice to see. Mike always uh, took pride in his seasonal staff as well. Um, he always maintained a nucleus of staff. I know a few of them are here today that have been here for a number of years. It's really nice to see um, not a lot of turnover in staff. Uh, very engaged staff. It was like a family here. It was really really unique and, and really nice to see and that's all because of Mike. His leadership was exceptional. This spring, um, prior to Mike going into the hospice, I reached out to our superintendents and, and who all knew Mike well and asked them to share some messages um, that we could forward to. to uh, <laughs> you found it? It's like the Oscars. <laughs> So I'm going to share a few, and I'll read these quickly, but I'll, I've, I've got about, there was, I think we got a response from every superintendent, and even, even the, the fellows that didn't know Mike really well, um, still sent a message to, to Mike and Nancy. It was really nice to see him. Some of the guys that knew him a little better obviously provided a little bit more detail. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some of these. Um, almost everyone mentions, references the fall brawl. Yeah. Um, Doug might talk about that as well. Um, just to clarify, that was our annual meeting. 
it was strictly business and meetings and uh, no fun. I don't know why it ever got called the fall brawl, but anyways, now you know what I, I'm talking about when, I, when these are referenced. This is a quote from Ben Ingram, who's uh, now at Cobble Beach. Uh, was a superintendent with us for, well, he was an employee of ours for probably 15 years. And has moved on to Cobble, but got to know Mike well over the years. Um, Mike uh, was, a, was first class with me. Loved the time I spent with him and was very knowledgeable and a great source of information. <coughs> a true gent. I know he has a cottage in Southampton, so let his wife know that if there's anything that they need, I'm 25 minutes away and I have a small army at, at their disposal. Um, I'll make sure to get you Ben's contact in. <laughs> <laughs> he does say it's genuinely, genuinely, please let You've Nancy know. You've already taken so. care of my house. So. <laughs> so, yeah, no, we haven't been in the cottage yet. Uh, from Greg Florence, uh, superintendent at Greystone, who played a lot of golf with Mike at, at the uh, industry events. Mike, I'm really going to miss our golf games together, and I wish I had played in more events with you. I'm not sure who I'll play with now, but I know I won't have as much fun as I did with you. You're always a 20-year-old in a 60-year-old body. <laughs> but, but your attitude towards work and life was wiser than any lifetime of experience. I'm going to miss you, and I think of you every day. We'll toast you at the brawl, uh, and we'll make sure Heron Point never forgets the time you spent there. Um, making it so special. You are one of a kind, Bert. From Andrew Marsden, one of our younger superintendents at Caledon Woods. Unfortunately, I only had the chance to meet Mike once at last year's fall brawl. Uh, we were all having a chat after a round in the parking lot, and one thing that sticks out in my mind, other than obviously seeming like a great guy, is wondering how he ended up with a proper wine glass and bottle of wine out on the golf cart. <laughs> I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> and had a really good laugh. Our thoughts will be with Mike and his family during this difficult time. From Sean Gunn at the Country Club, uh, I'm hoping uh, the best for you and your family, Mike. Many moons ago, when I first joined Club Link, my first real encounter with the superintendents was the fall brawl. Uh, now you know why I had to preface that. <laughs> at, uh, at that motel, uh, in brackets, you remember the one, woman's door got kicked in. Uh, I thought I'd get more laugh out of that. <laughs> As the new guy, I was with all the guys, but no one came up to me to say hello while we stood out under the covered porch. About an hour went by, me standing there alone, and you came up and started chatting with me. I'll never forget that day, and I just wanted to thank you for making me feel better. But getting to know you over the years, that's just the kind of guy you were, a genuine, caring guy. I've got one more. From Andrew Diva, Glen Ivy. Uh, Mike, I want to say thank you. The day I walked into my first spring meeting as a young superintendent, I was clueless and frankly terrified. From our first conversation to our last, you always treated me as an equal and showed a genuine interest in me. Throughout the years, your good nature uh, never wavered. You always checked in on me whether to offer help, support, or just to be someone I could bitch to. Sorry, Deep. Complain to. I will always remember this, and I promise to treat every generation that comes the same way. So Nancy, Michelle, and Matt, on behalf of uh, the superintendents at Club Link and, and all of Mike's friends in the golf business, I want to pass along our sincere condolences. Mike will always be remembered for his good nature and his professionalism and his sense of humor. and. Uh, we're going to miss them. And I, I have to say, the, the, and I, last but not least, the greatest laugh in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks. celebrate Mike's life. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Doug Davidson. I'm a colleague. Uh, I'm a golf course superintendent. I've known Mike for about 20 years. 
Uh, I know we all miss him, and I've spent a lot of time lately thinking about how we're going to remember him. And uh, I just say today, let's celebrate his life. He would hate the fact that he was missing the party, for sure. And uh, <clears throat> Mike, or B-Tone, as we affectionately knew him, uh, was a colleague, a mentor, a friend, and a lot of fun to play golf with. Mike epitomized the traits of many successful superintendents. He was honest, quiet, humble, hardworking, and the earliest riser I know. He was proud of his golf course, his team, and their efforts, and he was proud to showcase his golf course anytime. You would never know that he'd hosted a number of professional events or that his club was in the top 50 in Canada. He was very humble and very down to earth. The fact that Mike persevered in this trade for as long as he did is a testament to his character. It is a tough business. Early mornings, members, climate, weather, catastrophes, working with retirees, working with, working with students a half to a third of your age can take its toll on your mental and physical health. But Mike persevered. When I was a rookie superintendent, he was extremely helpful and a great resource. He was always willing to take or return a phone call and share some of his ex accumulated experience. I frequently relied on him for ideas about human resources, grass growing, and how to find a, a work-life balance. Mike was always willing to lend you a piece of equipment, but he'd always insist you come and get it personally. This was just an excuse to have a visit, tour the golf course, and share war stories. He'd show you his successes and struggles, those visits were important in a trade that can at times be quite lonely. In the winter, we'd periodically get together for breakfast. There was a little place not too far from Heron Point where the waitresses knew him. It was clear they were happy to see him, and he was happy to see them. Mike was like that, friendly, decent, and salt of the earth. We frequently roomed together at golf, work, or association events. In fact, we roomed together with such regularity that Mike once asked me if I thought people were getting ideas about us. <laughs> One of the first times we roomed together was when we wrote the Mosquito and Biting Fly Pesticide License. I woke up pretty early, not Mike early, to find the lights on, CNN blaring on the TV, and Mike sitting by the window having a smoke studying for the exam. Did I wake you? Uh, what do you think? <laughs> but he was determined to pass. It was a tough exam, but he passed it. Many experienced superintendents didn't. He was determined, and he was a good golf course superintendent. But perhaps the most important lesson I learned from Mike, to keep what we do, golf course management, in perspective. Managing a golf course isn't life or death. While it is important to take your career seriously and be proud of what you do, don't forget to play a round of golf, socialize, and enjoy life. So much of what Mike did, of what golf course superintendents do, enables people to have fun, relax, and enjoy themselves. Mike reminded me to do the same. And I think this is why Mike's participation in our professional associations and other golf events were so important to him. The idea of associating and sharing ideas with other superintendents and with colleagues, facing the same challenges and struggles and just enjoying each other's company helps to keep what we do, manage golf courses, in perspective. Now, Mike managed to play for the better part of a decade without using a driver. He had a two iron, a three iron, and at one time, a one iron. I'm sure you have all heard what Lee Trevino said about a one iron. Even God couldn't hit it. Well, Mike couldn't hit it either. <laughs> Yet somehow, despite having a swing that I once described as watching a ladder collapse, <laughs> which, he, which he found funny and harsh, <laughs> he somehow managed to put together a round and get a win for his side. He had, by necessity, a very good short game. He liked to play, but more importantly, he liked to socialize. Now, Mike, I'm sure, wasn't a social media guy. To him, it would have been anti-social media. Uh, he was more about getting together and having a good time. But I thought I'd share a few comments from Twitter uh, when I announced Mike's passing on Twitter uh, to his uh, industry colleagues. Uh, these are just some of the remarks that some of his industry colleagues said about him on Twitter. First of all, that classic laugh of his. 
He was a great grower of grass and a producer of fine playing surfaces. I never saw him without a smile. Mike was such a kind, supportive man, very wise and the best listener I know. You couldn't help but smile when hearing his laugh. What an honor and pleasure to have known him and call him a friend. Mike was a great man and his laugh was world class. He was my boss for a number of years in high school at Heron Point and always tried to get us on a few great golf courses in the area to say thanks for putting in early hours and long, uh, long put in early and long hours. <coughs> Excuse me. Big laugh, big smile, great superintendent. Mike was always very kind to me. He was a good man. Mike was a good man. No, he was a great man. Will always forever remember the chance he took on me as an assistant. Forever grateful to him. He was indeed a very humble, nice man. Suffice to say, Mike was respected and well liked in our industry. Mike was a fixture at our annual Clubling Superintendent's Fall Meeting, nicknamed the Fall Brawl. The golf was incidental to catching up with colleagues and having a good time. And Mike was the senior statesman. In fact, I pleaded with him, you have to get healthy because I don't want to be the senior statesman from here. <laughs> uh, he was always one of the last to go to bed and definitely the first up in the morning. And he also served as the grill master, cooking to perfection 30 or so steaks for all attendees. At the last fall brawl in October 2018, he celebrated the end of the round with that glass of red wine beside the 18th green at Rocky Crest. I asked how he played. Ah, uh, some good shots, some bad shots, but the wine was good. <laughs> I took a photo of him beside his golf cart, glass of wine in one hand, a bottle in the other, with a huge smile on his face. This is how I'll always remember him. Mike had a characteristic laugh. It's been often imitated, but never duplicated. <laughs> it definitely comes up at almost every event, there's an imitation of Mike's laugh. You could always tell where he was in the room based on where his laugh was coming from. On a good night, it was heard frequently. The last time we saw him on what seems like one of the few good spring days, we sat in his backyard, enjoyed the sunshine, and reminisced. He asked about Glen Cairns and the Greens, and with superintendents, that's the, the equivalent of asking about your children. Even though he was very ill, we still managed to coax a couple of those characteristic laughs, and I'll cherish that memory. I'll close with a final anecdote about Mike, and it will illustrate what I knew about him. My wife and I were planning a trip to the Dominican Republic with friends. And they were all over at our place, uh, having a couple of bottles of wine and trying to make a decision about which resort to attend. I knew Mike had been a couple of times, so I was texting with him that evening about resorts while we bro uh, browsed the travel brochures. We came across a resort that featured a phone party. <laughs> so I texted Mike the following two words, phone party followed by a question mark. And without missing a beat, he sent me a picture of him right in the middle of a phone party <laughs> with a beer in one hand and a big smile. And the lesson I got from that, you're more likely to regret what you didn't do than what you did do. If you want to honor Mike's memory, remember this. If life offers you an opportunity to go to the phone party, make sure you go to the phone party. <laughs> Goodbye, B-Tone, we'll miss you a lot, and the fall brawl won't be without you. But yeah, won't be the same without you. Cheers. Thank you. My sister wants to say something. Just briefly. If you don't know me, I am the favorite sister. And I had no intention of being here at the moment. Uh, but something happened last week. I heard something and it stayed with me through this time. I was watching TV and I was watching Stephen Colbert and a Canadian actor named Keanu Reeves was being interviewed. And um, towards the end of the interview, Stephen Colbert said to him, so what happens to us when we die? And Keanu didn't say anything for a second and he thoughtfully replied, well, all I know is the ones that love us will miss us. I thought it was worth repeating. sharing it brings to life a person's soul I want to just uh, close with a few thoughts as we're celebrating Mike's life today um, it comes to mind that we're here seemingly because of his passing on May 5th but 
in actual fact, we're here because of what happened long before that on November 3rd, 1955. And do you remember November 3rd, 1955? <laughs> it was his birth. Yes, it was his birth. Uh, maybe I jog your memory more accurately. It wasn't just about his birth, but rather nine months before that when he was conceived in your womb. You have that, that date you may or may not remember. Um, <laughs> but the fact is, he actually, in, the, in his mother's womb, he was conceived. The mic that we know that ended up with the laugh, that ended up being excellent, what he did this, was conceived way back then. And the actual fact is that if you go even before that, the Bible scriptures tell us that he was perceived or created or designed before God even started work on the earth and the heavens. So the father God had Mike and who he wanted to create as a unique, wonderful expression of his love. Uh, long before that, Mike was in fact, as all of our, us are, a unique masterpiece of the and, and living example of the creativity of God. So unfortunately, some of us don't realize that about ourselves. And so we don't realize that about the people we touch every day until something happens. And we don't see their value. We don't see their uniqueness. We don't appreciate the gifts that are all around us until after they pass. And when they pass, then we see the gap in us and understand how valuable they were. Um, when that happens, of course, there's often sorrow. When we look back and see the depth and value of that, a life and the impact they had on us after they're gone. We've heard a lot about what Mike did, how well he did it, but you know, a measure of a man's life is not just about what he did, but it is about how he did it, and the manner he did it. Mike did what he did with excellence. It's not about what he knew. I don't think he was in summer school because of what he knew. <laughs> Uh, but it's about the way that he took knowledge, gained knowledge, and what he did with that knowledge. It's not about what Mike achieved as a superintendent, as someone highly respected as we hear from his colleagues. It wasn't about that, but it's really about how he helped others, including his family, including other superintendents, including his friends, and helped them achieve. That's the my legacy that Mike left to each of us that knew him as friends. Certainly as a superintendent, he was a master greenskeeper. He was uh, part horticulturalist, part agriculturalist, part expert gardener, and in some ways just part farmer, uh, if you've seen their backyard. Um, I'm not sure that he deliberately uh, chose that profession, chose that occupation, but that occupation for sure, by the evidence of what he left behind, was chosen for him. He understood the impact of, of weather on the vegetation, the water, and how much it, uh, the, on the soil, the, the wind, and what damage it may or may not do, the temperature and its effect on this huge, beautiful garden that he considered his own. That he nurtured every long day of the spring, the summer, the fall. I do, did have a son who worked with Mike for a summer or two, and remember driving him sometimes at 4.30 in the morning to get dropped off long, long days. But then I also sometimes got more time with Mike sitting around uh, and seeing him in the winter when every day of the winter he thought about, wondered what was happening underneath the snow and planned for the next spring. Mike uh, might not have easily been seen as a philosopher or as a scientist, but he did know a lot about an ancient principle. It's an endless principle that's existed from the time the earth began it will continue to exist for as long as the sun rises and sets. It's a principle of sowing and reaping. It's a principle of seed time and harvest. It's the principle about a seed and, and the corresponding fruit. Uh, a tree, like a life, is known by its fruit. Uh, everyone can stand and tell you for years that a certain tree is an apple tree and that you wanted to be in an apple orchard. But when the fruit appears, if it shows up as a pear, there's no question, it's a pear tree, no matter what people say. Mike is ultimately known by the lifelong fruit, some of which, just a portion of which you heard from the family, heard from his friends. 
and, and uh, even the tweets and the emails today. And the thing with fruit is that it, every fruit contains a seed, so it reproduces itself. And when fruit, fruit naturally grows, it ripens on the tree, the autumn winds blow, it falls off, falls to the ground. The other shell and, and the flesh of the fruit returns to feed that ground. But the seed that inside there remains intact. The great mystery of the seed is that it has the life power within itself. No matter how small a seed is, all the power of an oak tree is in an acorn. It's in a seed. We often don't realize it uh, or experience that power until that seed goes into the ground. A seed sitting on the shelf, we know what it can do, but it doesn't do it. A seed, until it goes into the ground, that's when it becomes, it appears to look buried and dead. But when that happens, transformation happens. When that happens, at that very time, the true mysterious life of seeds and of that seed is released and comes to life in a brand new tree or a brand new plant or a blade of grass, such as Mike's life. Just when we think that his life is gone, we're going to realize, and we're starting to realize even in dialogue today and hearing the stories and experience that his life's fruit is evidenced. It's evidence in the seed and the seeds of Mike that are in each of us, especially as children. Mike's presence on this earth, the reality of his life having been created by God, birthed and, and living in this in this uh, age, will continue as his presence on earth ultimately known by, the, uh, by his fruit. The fruit are those real footprints, the impressions that he left in and on each of us. Those seeds of himself that were invested in the positive, into us and into, you can tell by the stories, into countless others who you and me and even Nancy may not even know their names. The people at the the cafe nearby. We all know and experience that Mike was always quick to freely share his God-given gifts, and it's that fruit that lives on in us, the evidence of Mike's life and character. It remains and lives on through our lives, so remember it. Even while Mike has gone ahead of us into the eternal age that is yet to come for all of us. Michael Burton. Uh, what did you call it? B? Beto. Beto or Mike. That name Michael has Hebrew roots and it means who is like God or who is like the source or it means <laughs> gift from God. So every time you called him by name, whether you knew it or not, you were declaring that Mike was a gift from God. Let today be the beginning and not the end of our true celebration and memory of Mike's life as a gift from God. Now when a loved one, a son, a husband, a father, a brother, a daughter, an uncle, a friend leaves us, they're sorry. That's a natural thing. The grieving process is necessary and healthy for all of us. The scripture says, weeping lasts throughout the night. But in the morning when daybreak comes, there's joy. So I want to read just a little section from a book by Henry Nguyen called The Road to Daybreak. How do I choose life over death? There are a few moments without the opportunity to choose since death and life are always before me. Few of us have a chance to choose what time we die. One aspect of choosing life is choosing joy. Joy is life-giving, but sadness brings death. And a sad heart is a heart in which something is dying. A joyful heart is a heart in which something is new and is being born. Joy is much more than a mood. A mood invades us. We do not choose a mood. We often find ourselves in a happy or depressed mood without knowing where it comes from. But the spiritual life is a life beyond moods. It's a life in which we choose joy and do not allow ourselves to become victims of passing feelings, or te of temporary happiness, or prolonged times of apathy, 
depression, or despair. We can choose joy. Every moment, we can decide to respond to an event or a person with joy instead of sadness. When we truly believe that God is life, and only life, then nothing need have the power to draw us into the sad realm of death. To choose joy does not mean to choose happy feelings or an artificial atmosphere of cheerfulness, but it does mean the determination to let whatever takes place bring us one step closer to the God of life. At this time, I want to have each of us, could we all stand? I want us together to pray for the family. I have a couple of scriptures I'd just like to read. The Apostle Paul's first letter to his to the dedicated followers of Jesus in the city of Corinth in chapter 15 says, Now I tell you this, my brothers and sisters, flesh and blood are not able to inherit God's kingdom, and neither will that which is decaying be able to inherit what is incorruptible. Listen, and I'll tell you a divine mystery. Not all of us will die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in an instant, in an atom of time, in the twinkling of an, his eye. For when the last trumpet is sounded, the dead will come back to life. We will be indestructible, and we will be transformed. For we will discard our mortal clothes and slip into a body that is imperishable. What is mortal now will be exchanged for immortality. And when that which is mortal puts on immortality, and what now decays is exchanged for what will never decay, then the scripture from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah will be fulfilled, which says, death is swallowed up in triumphant victory. So death, tell me, where is your victory? Tell me death, where is your scorpion-like uh, sting? It is sin that gives death its sting in the law that gives sin its power. But we thank God and accept his grace in Christ Jesus for giving us the victory as conquerors through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. So now, beloved ones, stand firm and secure. Live your lives with an unshakable confidence because we know that we prosper and excel and always have the Lord's possessions in abundance in every season by serving the Lord, because we are assured that our union with the Lord makes our labor productive with fruit that endures. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Eternal One, collectively we thank you. You as God's, uh, as Mike's creator, Savior and Lord, thanks for giving to him, to us, as a gift. We know that Mike is not dead, but he has been ushered into the realm of eternity with you. Lord, we're here before you to continue to celebrate Mike's life, but Mike's departure from this world and from our lives with him leaves us in sorrow and grief, especially for Nancy, Michelle, Ryan, Matthew, Alexis, Anne, Linda, and Michael, and Mike's other family members and dear friends. So Lord, we ask that your peace would be upon them. For all of them, we ask you that you uh, will do to them according to what you've told us in your word. That though we may weep through the night at daybreak, it will be turned into shouts of ecstatic joy. We say rejoice in the Lord always, you've told us. And again, you said rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That, Father, you would let the peace of God, which surpasses our comprehension and understanding, guard Nancy and the family's hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore we thank you Father Amen, Amen.